Welcome to the library this evening. My name is Renee, and I'm delighted that y'all could be here tonight. I'd also like to welcome those of you who are viewing the program through our live stream online. This is the third installment of the Space Science series. Caitlin's fourth and final appearance will, at the library will be Tuesday, April 17th. So be sure to put that on your calendars. For her talk, um, it will be on constellations and mythology and culture. And if you could please, before you leave this evening, take a few moments to share your thoughts on the evaluation forms that are available. We appreciate your feedback. It helps us plan for future programs here at the library. It's my pleasure to welcome Caitlin Ahrens to the library again this evening. Caitlin's currently working on her PhD in space and planetary science at the University of Arkansas. She helped plan and build the Pluto Lab at Arkansas Center for Planetary Simulations and now manages that. Along with her current research and other duties, she is also a NASA Solar System Ambassador. Caitlin also guest hosts a mini radio show with our local NPR radio station, KUAF 91.3, called Scratching the Surface. Please help me welcome Caitlin Aarons. Yay! Awesome, all right. Can everyone hear me? Great. Woohoo. Awesome, good. All righty. So, the thing about women of astronomy is there's always some sort of hidden secrets behind the curtain. It's almost like a Wizard of Oz kind of deal where it's what magic lies behind uh, uh, that curtain kind of deal. So, we're going to actually go through a little bit of a history lesson, not so much of picking out certain women, because uh, that can take up an entire semester's worth of material, but certainly looking at the trends that we've seen of women through astronomy. So we will have quite a few examples, and it's amazing how many women in astronomy there are. Because if I were to ask you, can you name a woman of science, usually the answers I get, at least through my undergraduate students that I teach is either um, Marie Curie, which is a chemist, or Ada Lovelace, which is a programmer, or certainly Sally Ride, which is an astronaut. And that's about it. Unfortunately, that is about it. Actually, not a lot of people know about Sally Ride, so that's, that's kind of unfortunate too. Uh, so, so like I said, we're going to go through history, uh, pretty much. As far as narrowing down what to talk about, because by all means, there are hundreds of women involved uh, with astronomy. So really had to pick and choose because I only have a certain amount of time with you lovely people tonight. So, uh, so bear with me uh, for going through some of these. Uh, I did not include astronauts because astronauts are actually on their own playing field whatsoever. I'm simply looking at astronomers. Uh, so those who have <laughs> mainly stayed here on Earth and helped us guide us to that era of having women astronauts and women nowadays too. So let's get started. So this one, uh, Hypatia, is actually very interesting. She's actually the first recorded female astronomer in ancient Egypt. Uh, so she's actually very notable for constructing astrolabs. So astrolabs are very interesting uh, some piece of equipment. It almost looks like a very golden compass-like kind of deal. They're actually really not that big, but they help you align where you are in the sky. So before any star maps were actually made, if you wanted to remember where certain stars were, you would take that compass and align your eye up to that measuring point, and you can angle yourself to what stars you're looking at. And then from there, you can figure out seasons, you can figure out eclipses from that point. Uh, this was certainly one of the very few female mathematicians of the time. She uh, had actually grown up with Ptolemy at that point uh, as well. Uh, and then eventually she became head of uh, a school in Alexandria. So time-wise, this is actually after uh, the Library of Alexandria had burned. So just keeping that time in mind that essentially anything that she would have had to learn either had to come from Ptolemy or self-taught. So now we're going to go really forward in time. 
1500s now. So not a lot has been recorded, unfortunately, or if they were, again, we're simply looking at females here. Uh, so now we get into uh, Tycho Brahe's sister, Sophia. So Tycho Brahe, uh, we teach a lot in astronomy. Uh, and he's most notably for actually having the golden nose. Uh, he was actually uh, forced into a sword duel and lost his nose. So he constructed his own nose out of gold and unfortunately got metal poisoning off of that. <laughs> so, so fun stuff. Really fun uh, random facts like that, though. But Tycho Brahe is forefront of what kind of uh, planetary orbits we have. I, he actually was on the forefront of going, oh, planets don't just stick to the sky. They actually go around other things. This is great. So his sister actually helped him out with his calculations. And in Denmark, they were known as the Danish double star because they wanted to give Sophia credit. It wasn't just Tycho did this and Tycho did that. It was the both of them. They were a tag team. So then also jumping forward here, we have Elizabeth from Germany. Uh, so again, taking calculations from Tycho Brahe. Now she is considered mother of the moon charts. Now we're starting to record what we're actually seeing in space. And women at this point are now excellent recorders. Uh, so she's considered to be the first female astronomer in the sense of recording uh, things. So she's actually cataloged over a thousand stars and their positions. And not just, well, there's a star, there's a star, there's a star. Great. No. She actually went through what positions they had. So this is a very elaborate astrolab uh, uh, scaled wise. It's, not, it's no longer a handheld uh, measuring device. It's a much larger uh, deal. This is her brother that she helped out with as well. Uh, but then another thing, too, she alphabetized them. Now we're actually starting to get a system of the writing. It's not just star A, star B, star C. They're finally alphabetized by some sort of uh, excuse me, constellations, which constellations I'll talk about next month. <laughs> Nicole from France. She is interesting. <laughs> She's gorgeous, too. Uh, but... Not a lot of credit has been given to her, unfortunately. Uh, she did a lot of mathematics, and it's astounding, absolutely astounding. And this is the start where male counterparts take over credit and not give it to the female uh, as part of time here. So starting out from like helping out relatives and so on, which we'll see a few more here in a, here in a bit, though. But she's one of the first examples of having that, that crossover, though. So, first off, predicted the return of Halley's Comet. So she actually teamed up with the French Academy of Sciences. That's fantastic. They worked for six whole months of just pure calculations I, and trying to figure out, like, okay, this is what we got to do, and then all the orbits take calculations from Tycho and Sophia and uh, everybody. Uh, and so and so on and so forth. They were only a month off. They were only a month off. That's incredible. You know, we take our, our phones and computers and calculators for granted, though, but to do all of this by hand, and telescopes were still a very new thing at the time, too. Um, so keep in mind, Galileo with his telescope was in the 1610s. <laughs> Not that far off. So... Uh, so not only did she help predict Halley's Comet, there was also a solar eclipse timing. She got that uh, right on the spot, uh, constructed another star catalog. Uh, you'll see a lot of star catalogs uh, coming up with, uh, with a lot of the female contenders here. But this last one was amazing. She actually created with her husband, an astronomical base clock. It was her idea. She actually went to her husband and say, wouldn't it be cool if instead of having a very pretty or innate clock, but it can help tell lunar phases? Hmm. 
that would be interesting. So she actually uh, had her husband write the book on the clock making, because he certainly knew all the bits and pieces, all the pendulums and all that though, but she did the mathematics of how quickly did that pendulum have to move. The length of the pendulum affects the movement, how the movement would affect telling the time of that clock in relation to astronomy. The problem with that though is that most of the credit was still given to her husband. Carolyn Herschel, uh, she's, she's a favorite among astronomers, uh, mainly because Herschel, uh, her brother, uh, William Herschel, has made quite a bit of discoveries. He actually discovered Uranus. Uh, he actually made a, a fantastic telescope uh, in the uh, mid 18 or uh, 1800s, yeah. Uh, but she herself, again, helped her brother, self-taught herself astronomy, discovered five comets, and also discovered M110, uh, which is an elliptical galaxy that, this is actually pretty cool, it's around the Andromeda galaxy. So our galaxy actually has what's called satellite galaxies. So they're little tiny fuzzballs of galaxies zipping around our own galaxy. So M110 is actually a satellite galaxy. It's actually zipping around the Andromeda galaxy. So the fact that she was able to see that with her brother's telescope is like, oh, that's so cool. Yay. Um, and then first woman awarded a gold medal at the Royal Astronomical Society. Yes. All right. Now we're getting some progress. Maybe. <laughs> we're getting there. Uh, so now, uh, Mary Somerville actually does not get a lot of credit as well. Uh, she actually was the first one to take Laplace's mathematics. So anybody who's a physicist, like me, we have to go through what's called Laplace mathematics. So it's just an interesting art form of calculus. It's a very interesting form of calculus. But Laplace was French. And at the time, it was amazing. All that calculus work, it's brand new types of mathematics and no English speaker can decipher it. So Mary Somerville self-taught herself mathematics and was able to translate Laplace's mathematics textbook, make an English textbook. So that is incredible as well. And even Laplace himself um, was able to say, this is the only woman to actually understand my work perfectly enough that other people couldn't understand it. Fantastic. And then in the meantime, Neptune hasn't been discovered yet though, but she found irregularities in Uranus's orbit. And she thought, I bet there's another planet out there. But unfortunately, she never got to continue that work. And then it was taken up uh, by someone who actually did discover Neptune with a telescope and so on and so forth. But I thought this was cool. Ada Lovelace, the first computer programmer the first computer programmer, not technical computer, but certainly deciphering code of any form. Ada Lovelace, her mathematics tutor was Mary Somerville. So cool. So Mary Somerville needs to get a good round of applause for that. <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> she would be proud. All right, so we have Maria Mitchell. Okay, so now we're getting into uh, more of the American side of stuff now. Uh, fun fact, distant relative of Benjamin Franklin though, but <laughs> unfortunately never really helped her out in that regard. Uh, but she did discover a telescope. So uh, the King of Denmark at the time would actually award anybody from around the world comet seekers with gold medals if you were to use a telescope and she happened to discover a comet, got a gold medal, and they named it Miss Mitchell's Comet. So I thought that was, that was really adorable. Uh, and then later on, she wanted to do more sun-related stuff. So uh, she began observations of sunspots using her eyes. That's not a good idea. Don't do that. 
No, Galileo did that and he blinded himself and she nearly blinded herself too. Uh, so no, <laughs> luckily 1873, they thought, well, why don't we start with photography of the sun? Much safer, not by much, but it's safer than using your eyes. So um, if you want to view the sun, use very specific solar telescopes for that. Um, but at the time they weren't, they weren't available. Uh, but she was uh, a professor of, of sorts and actually took her students and traveled uh, to see the total solar eclipse in Denver, Colorado. I thought that was cool. Field trip. I would love to have taken a field trip like that. <laughs> um, and again, now she is elected to fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association of the Advancement of Science. So that's, that is quite the achievement. So we're, we're truly chugging along through this trend of great, women are finally getting elected to some of these higher up societies. Margaret Huggins, love the hair. I, so now we're getting into, okay, we know, we know stars, we know planets, we know orbits, everything's uh, so much fun in a telescope. So now let's do more of the physics behind it. Let's do more of the chemistry behind it. So she is actually the pioneer of what's called spectroscopy. So spectroscopy, if I were to look at a star, each star that you see in the sky gives off its own wavelengths, whether it's energy, it's temperature, it's color, everything, the different kinds of elements inside of that star gives off a different signature. And we have to do that by spectroscopy. So she was a pioneer to actually figure out, oh, all these stars do something different. So she helped out make the Atlas of Stellar Spectra. So very, very important for us astronomers when we're trying to look at certain stars, we want to see like, okay, which stars have more hydrogen? Which stars have more helium? Which ones have more carbon? I, she was certainly the pioneer for that. She was called the Herschel of the, of the spectroscope. That's pretty big. She helped in the development of that. All righty. So now this is a really fun part of, of the uh, astronomical American history, though. So Harvard at one point was actually a conglomeration of little colleges before it eventually became one giant Harvard University. At the time, Harvard College had Radcliffe College as their physics and astronomical department. And they had quite a few observatories. Great. So this is uh, 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 Pickering. <laughs> Excuse me for that. His name is Pickering. Uh, so he was actually in charge of all of these observatories. And this is where it gets interesting, is that uh, all of his lab workers, all of the people to do all the observations, all the uh, note-taking, all the calculations, women. He specifically had women. He actually had uh, quite a few men work with him in the very beginning and thought, no, women can do it faster. Women can do it quicker. Uh, and women are more precise. So these were actually called the Pickering women. So I'm going to go through some of these uh, brilliant women. So he had just an army of women work for him, though. But unfortunately, being called a Pickering woman, you're essentially, that's it. No name. You were given the title of Pickering woman. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, a few of them, though. So this is Wilhelmina. I, if, yeah, I'm sure some of you guys have probably seen this lovely picture uh, from whether it's Hubble Space Telescope mainly, but this is the Horsehead Nebula out of the Orion Nebula. And Wilhelmina actually discovered that lovely nebula. And it does look like a horse head, doesn't it? Uh, but her job was to specifically uh, design a system for stars. Again, how much hydrogen is observed in that spectra. So she was... Uh, at least the first one to figure that out. Okay, 
we need to start sorting all of the spectra out of stars. So then, next one, Annie Jump Cannon. Sure, her name comes up a lot when I teach uh, astronomy. That's actually a, most, uh, most astronomy textbooks really place her at the front part with our stellar classification. So today, as of today, we still use her stellar classification. Um, so she actually, what's called the that classification, so what I like to have my students recite is, oh, be a fine guy or girl, kiss me. <laughs> Um, so if ever, uh, it's really funny during an exam, whenever I have a, a whole room of 200 some students and they come to that part, I can hear them recite, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, and it's just over and over and over again, and then they, they remember it. Unfortunately, they, they don't remember her name, but they remember the classification. Oops. Uh, so, uh, okay. Um, but still, we still use her classification. That is absolutely astounding. So she published the first stellar spectra catalog, 1901. And then this is also where it gets interesting too, is that she's also the first woman to receive an honorary doctorate out of the States <laughs> from a, a European university. So this is cool. So now that we're getting into an era of honorary doctorates for women and it's gonna become a little bit more popular to give women honorary doctorates. Henrietta Leavitt. Uh, so again, going through all of my astrophysics, we actually had to use the period luminosity relationship. And I'm not gonna lie, I never knew that that was created by Henrietta. I never knew it was created by a woman. So as I'm going through this presentation, I'm learning stuff too. So this, this has been really entertaining for me. Uh, but we still, again, we use this relationship. So what this relationship does is that there's a specific kind of star that acts really, really weird. We call them Cepheids. So Cepheids, most stars are supposed to eventually just kind of dim down over time and then eventually go poof. Cepheids, on the other hand, start to go a little dim, and then they bright up. And then they kind of dim right back down, and then they bright up again. And because of their brightening, can tell us about how far away they are, which is pretty cool. So the period, how often does it bright up and dim down? Uh, their luminosity, how bright that would be. And then it creates a relationship for, great, that's how far away it is. Cool. So she figured that out. Hey, that's good. And then they are a type of variable star, so the whole difference of, of brightening and dimming and brightening and dimming. Uh, thousands of variable stars, she got to catalog them. That's, ah, that's so incredible. Anne Young. Uh, so Again, variable stars, looking at the, the dimming and the brightening of certain stars. Now, from uh, thousands, now we're like 6,500 variable star observations, so uh, way ahead of, of the previous one. Uh, but now she's finally earned a PhD from Columbia University in 1906. Uh, for actually having photographs of certain constellations, mainly the Pegasus constellation, and realizing there's a lot more stars that we don't see in particular with just telescopes. We need to actually have light coming into our cameras, and we can get a lot more light out of photographs. So now we're getting into astrophotography. And that's, that's fascinating then. Um, now, keep in mind, these aren't just like <laughs> click or anything with, with obviously not a phone, uh, but glass plates. These are actually glass plates of photographs that they had to really look at. Glass plates have been used for quite some time from here on out. And then Louise Jenkins. Uh, this one's not a Pickering woman, uh, but I wanted to include her in here, mainly for her research in parallax. So now we're wanting to know, okay, how far away are these objects that we're actually seeing? 
now we're catalog thousands of stars. How can we better get a better relationship of how far away are they? So it's something called parallax. And we've all experienced parallax one way or another. And I like telling my students this too. Uh, and you guys can do it right here, right now too. So hold up your thumb up in front of your face and then wink back and forth. See how your thumb kind of moves back and forth? Exactly. I love doing it in class too. But if you put your thumb way far away from you and blink back and forth, it doesn't move that much, does it? Stars do the same thing. You just did parallax. That is exactly what parallax does. The closer a star is to us, it's going to move like crazy in between photographs. But if it's really far away, it's going to barely nudge, which means it's really distant, really, really distant. So that is parallax. She actually made the relationship of like, great, okay, now we know how distant some of these objects are. All right, Cecilia. Uh, so Cecilia, I now goes into more of the chemistry of the stars. What are these stars actually made of? We know there's a lot of hydrogen and helium, and that was about it. But now she wants to know, do the temperatures and the elements coincide? In which case, that is a yes. <laughs> uh, very, very much so, and it's much, much trickier from, from, uh, from where she started and then where we are right now in current astronomy, though, um, because there's so many different kinds of elements. Ah, there's so many elements. Uh, but she was a, a good start to that particular study, though. Uh, so she actually had her own PhD thesis. She was the per first person out of uh, the Radcliffe College to earn that PhD. So who? Dr. Cecilia, here we go. Um, but again, now we're getting into different kinds of temperature of stars. Really, really hot stars are really, really big, and they have a lot, a lot of elements. Whereas you have itty-bitty stars, they're not so bright. They have a little bit of hydrogen and helium. All thanks to her. Good job, Cecilia. <laughs> then we have Helen. So yay, now we're getting in the 1900s. Uh, so Helen Hogg. Uh, uh, enhanced our understanding of Milky Way. The Milky Way is still incredibly hard to even figure out what in the world we're even doing because we've never left the Milky Way, ever. We've, <laughs> we've barely left the solar system from 1960s voyagers, uh, but we've never left the, our Milky Way galaxy. We can only guess as to what it looks like, so we assume it's a spiral galaxy. So why it's called Milky Way, it actually looks like spilt milk, over across the sky. We call it Milky Way, and that, that was about it. That was pretty much all we knew about the Milky Way. Uh, so Helen actually figured, okay, so if it's a spiral, then how do we know about its age and its size? So the best, best way that even us astronomers still do today to even characterize the Milky Way is pretend you're in a house, but you can't leave your house you don't know what the outside of your house looks like. So what do you do? Besides just kind of puttering around, watch YouTube or something, who knows, stream internet, eh. But you want to really know what the outside of your house looks like. So you look out the windows. You want to see what community you live in. Do you live in a place where you have gorgeous medieval castles around you? Do you have nice uh, brick buildings around you? Do you have wooden houses? Do you have log cabins? Are you out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> so by looking at what your neighborhood looks like, you have a pretty good idea of what your own house should look like. And that's how we were able to characterize the Milky Way, is that we can't leave it, can't leave our, our house Milky Way, but we can look at the other galaxies around us going, oh, well, that one's blue, that one's blue, that one's blue, we must be blue. That one has a lot of stars, that one has a lot of stars, that one's like, yeah, that's okay. So we must be somewhere in the middle. And that's, by far, that is the truly the farthest that we've gotten even today. <laughs> All right, Muriel Seyfert, unfortunately, does not get a lot of uh, credit as well, though, but she helped discover what planetary nebulae are. So these are 
It looks like a space donut, a rainbow space donut, which is what I like to call it. Uh, but these are spectacular because we call them planetary nebula because back in the 1600s when we saw them through telescopes, we truly thought that they looked like really giant planets. But instead, they're actually really giant pieces of gas. And what happens is that that little star right there is actually dead. That star has gotten so large over time, it can no longer hold and grasp all of the gas that it's eaten up over time and just went poof. So all of what you see here is that poof of that dead star. <laughs> yeah, also called a human computer. She was uh, getting out toward the Pickering woman uh, kind of kind of era. So now we're getting into World War II. This is where it got a little dicey for astronomers because a lot of the equipment used in astronomy actually was used for the war effort. So a lot of astronomy did not uh, do so well in the war time. Now, this is particularly interesting. There were torpedoes that were radio controlled that could be hacked and jammed. So there was actually a creation of a frequency hopping signal that was constructed by a player piano to actually mix the radio signals. And I actually used to have a player piano. Um, so, uh, so I thought this was like, oh man, this is so cool. What kind of creation was made from this? Who created this really cool thing that actually was never used until 1962. It was actually uh, modified for the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, so who actually created this? So some of you may not actually know who this woman is. Um, I certainly do. I hope some of you guys do too. Anybody know who this is? Okay. Um, is it Hedy Lamar? Yes, that is Hedy Lamar. So Hedy Lamar. So her real name is actually Hedwig Eva Maria Keisler. Yes, very much. She's actually from Austria. So she wanted to actually, she was originally an inventor. But no woman of that time would be such a title. But she's gorgeous. So she came to America to be an actress to try to also be an inventor at the same time. Now, I, so she's very much uh, uh, popularized by her 1949 film, Samson and Delilah, she, uh, playing the role of Delilah, and it won uh, all sorts of awards for that particular one, though. But when she came to America, her name got Americanized for Hedy Lamarr. Uh, so the cool part is, is that her invention of that jamming signal led to the creation of what we use every single day. GPS, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi, all from what, it, what we always know to be an actress. Um, so I, at the time, though, during her time, whenever she was trying to get through her inventions, she wanted to actually be part of the National Inventors Council during World War II. She wanted to be on that council, and she was denied. Instead, she was rather told your looks would rather sell bond, uh, war bonds. And she did just that. She traveled the nation, she did shows um, to sell war bonds, but never got into that council. And then finally got into the Inventors Hall of Fame. Good, finally, took a while. Um, but yes, Hedy Lamar. so I was so excited, like, ah, yes! <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All righty. Who has seen the movie or read the book? <laughs> it's amazing. If you want to check out the book, it's in the back of the room. Uh, this is an amazing film. If you have not seen it, you should. It is an amazing film. Uh, an amazing book as well, too. Book gets more into the history behind it, especially space race era. Uh, but the main main person to, to go around through is, uh, is Katherine Johnson, who is still alive. She's very much in her late 90s. 
Uh, but she really was a human computer before NASA was even a thing. So before NASA, you had NACA, which is the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. So at the time, it was pure mathematics. It was this pure calculations, trajectories. What kind of rocket propulsions were we going to have? How was it going to go up? And then how are we going to bring it back down? Uh, all the safety stuff for the astronauts at the time. Uh, certainly Project Mercury, very early NASA missions with Apollo, a uh, space shuttle mission, everything. And, and her recent accomplishments is that her calculations are still being used for when we want to send people eventually to Mars. She's done the calculations. Uh, several honorary doctorates, fantastic. I like this one too. I'm actually from West Virginia University, so um, proud alum here uh, as well. So Katherine Johnson, Vera Rubin, uh, Vera Rubin has actually caused quite a bit of controversy. Uh, unfortunately, back in 2015, mainly because she was supposed to get the Nobel Prize, and unfortunately, never did. Uh, so she actually was the first one to discover dark matter. So dark matter is still very much a fuzzy uh, definition in astronomy, though, but it's actually kind of spooky, kind of cool, but kind of spooky. So dark matter is that kind of weird energy that we still cannot detect. So energy in the sense of why are spiral galaxies spiral? That would be dark matter. There's something there that we still cannot detect, not with our own eyes, not with the wavelengths that we have instruments for, because there's some other wavelength there, we just don't know what it is. We don't know how to detect it. So for now, we just call it dark matter. Don't know what it is, but it's there. Um, so having dark matter op opened up a whole new branch of astronomy, a whole new branch really would have landed her the Nobel Prize. Nope. Unfortunately not. She was a sport about it, though. She was just like, no, no, the, the ones who did get the Nobel Prize, they deserve it. And she's, she was very humble, um, though. So unfortunately, we lost her in 2016. But she was, she was a sweetheart, though. Uh, she studied a lot of galaxies for the purpose of, of dark matter, though. So she was fantastic. Alrighty, so this is fun. So in 1992, we were supposed to get this grand comet to come toward Earth, and it was going to be awesome. We saw it way past uh, Saturn at the time, and we were having all of our telescopes toward it, and we were making measurements for it. We we're like, oh, it's going to be so close to Earth, and this is going to be so cool, and we're going to try to photograph as many times of this comet. It's going to be great. I, it, we got so excited for our gas until, until it got near Jupiter. <laughs> Jupiter's gravity force is so large, it actually tore apart the comet. So we call this the string of pearls. This used to be one comet, and then it tore it apart in little pieces. And one by one, it got swallowed by Jupiter to the point where it left scars. <laughs> So those black spots, and you know, the nice big red spot that we all knowingly love, but the big uh, darker spots there, that's the comet plunging into Jupiter and leaving, leaving Jupiter with a few black eyes. And then they disappeared over a matter of months. Perfectly fine. But it was like, no, we lost the comet. But aside from that, I, discovering that comet and the physics behind it I uh, really goes to Carolyn Shoemaker and her husband, Gene Shoemaker. Uh, uh, Carolyn is still uh, alive. I'm actually a friend of hers, so <laughs> giving her a nice shout out tonight. Um, but she's truly held the record for most dis comets discovered by an individual. Uh, most of the comets and asteroids that she has discovered uh, were from gra glass plates again, not from take a picture on your phone, no fancy cameras or anything, all from glass plates. Absolutely fantastic. 
Uh, and she self-taught herself. She was actually a elementary school teacher for the longest time. And then she decided to hang out with her husband at, at the local observatory and was like, well, this is fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. And now she's one of the leading experts of, of comets and asteroids. <laughs> so all, all from just going, hey, what you doing? Can I help? Hmm. <laughs> all right. I'm curious to know if anybody would happen to know what this would be. I ask my students this all the time, and they always say aliens, which is quite close. <laughs> Let's be real here. Who was almost going to say aliens? Yeah, me too. All right. So this is actually what I used to do, unfortunately, for a number of years. Um, but this is what we call a pulsar. So a pulsar is when you have a star that's essentially dead. It's a zombie star um, that's already gone through its lifetime. It used to have a nice, magnificent life, and it went poof. But what's left, the skeleton zombie star, won't die just yet. So it truly is a zombie. And then it spins really, really fast. And as it's spinning really, really fast, we call this a lighthouse effect, where the magnetic poles of the star actually expand miles and miles and miles. And it goes boop, boop. And we can hear the boop. So that little dark line there and that lovely peak up there, that's the boop. That is the boop of the pulsar. And we can detect these using radio telescopes. So at the time, when we got these really weird signals, almost the heartbeat of stars, just the constant booping, we had no idea what they were. And if you were to see earlier versions of these kinds of diagrams, this is the more modernized, I couldn't find a good enough image for the for the uh, earlier ones, but we would call them LGMs. And LGMs was the acronym for Little Green Men, because we truly thought they were alien signals. So lo and behold, they were actually stars. And the discoverer of pulsars, which opened up a whole new branch of astronomy again, is Jocelyn Bell. So Jocelyn Bell was actually supposed to be uh, uh, a Nobel Prize winner. Nope, it actually went to her advisor. Yep. So <laughs> some of us in the astronomy community are still like, ah, about it. Um, she's, she's, a, she's a sport uh, to those, so she's like, no, no, it's, it's all right. <laughs> uh, but her discovery of pulsars now gives us a better sense of what kind of stars are even more so in our universe, especially the life cycles of some of these stars, for some of them to turn into pulsars. Within my lifetime, we discovered a new type of pulsar, actually, um, called a millisecond pulsar. So that booping goes so fast that we actually have to slow down the pulse to make sure that it's even a pulsar. Um, so usually, pulsars, when you hear pulsars, uh, it actually it sounds like knocking. And each knock would be the turning. Millisecond pulsars go, ee! they're going so fast you can't pick up the pulse anymore. So in my lifetime, we've actually discovered millisecond pulsars. Uh, another type of pulsar that's really, really cool I want to talk about real quick is a black widow pulsar. These are really, really cool. So black widow pulsars is when you have a pulsar just kind of minding its own business and just kind of spinning around and stuff. And it has a, a partner which is usually a planet or another star just kind of hanging out beside it like, hey, star, how's it going? Oh, you know what? I'm kind of slowing down a bit. I think I'll eat you. And it will actually rip <laughs> apart its neighboring star and actually spin back up and rejuvenate itself. So we call those black widow pulsars. And then that star eventually dies. <laughs> so it gets, gets really, really interesting. Space is very scary. <laughs> It's awesome, but it's scary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Good job. All right, who has read this book or seen the movie? 
Not a lot of people have, unfortunately, though. It's actually quite an interesting movie. Uh, the, honestly, the book is better. Uh, the movie gets more into the, like, the cinematics of it, though. Um, if, if you try watching this movie with a bunch of radio astronomers like I have, it's a nightmare. Because <laughs> there's a lot of wrong uh, science things going on in contact, though. But, but for the sake of, of having entertainment, it's a really good movie. But the movie and the book, Carl Sagan actually wrote it as almost like a, like a love letter, I, as a biography, a very fictitious biography, though, on Jill Tarter. Uh, so Jill Tarter was actually now a former director of the SETI Institute. SETI is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute. Uh, but her work is mainly toward using pulsars and then trying to figure out, well, if we can receive signals, can we put signals into space? What would happen then? Could we have other beings, other civilizations catch our signals back up in the space? So that was her job, is not only the listening, but also the taking signals out in the space all over the place and see what happens. Uh, so shout out uh, to Sarah Scholes. Uh, her rec very recent biography of Jill Tarter and the history of SETI, Making Contact. Um, so fantastic read for that too. So now I want to give a little perspective here on the missions. You know, I'm going through all the history of women and certainly with stellar spectra and stuff though, but what about missions? What about planetary missions though? Uh, so this was actually created by a colleague of mine, Julie Rathbun. Uh, there's really not that much, but you got to think about the, the time uh, of most of these, though. So going through Viking all the way, uh, Cassini finally got an uplift of, of females during the mission. Now, most of what's going on with Cassini, even though it's no longer a mission, there's a lot of women with Cassini now. Um, and then certainly New Horizons, uh, which I work with uh, a lot of women for New Horizons, which is the Pluto mission, uh, Dawn mission. Oh, I, I know a few people from Dawn, all female, which is fantastic. But it's kind of a weird curve, too, because you're not starting out so great. And then it kind of goes up and then a little bit down a little bit, though. Uh, MAVEN is kind of an uh, outlier in this regard, though, because MAVEN was actually planned years in advance. Years and years and years in advance. Uh, so MAVEN is kind of a, yeah, it's, it's there. It's there, but we're, get, we're getting better. We're trying to get more women involved with planetary missions as well. Uh, so I get asked a particular question, uh, though. Anybody watch The Big Bang Theory? A little bit. All right. So I get asked the question of, am I, am I representative of any of the characters? Uh, so we have two very much extremes as far as how do we view women in, in planetary science? Are we, the, are we like Ripley, like us, or are we an Amy? I'm usually characterized as Amy in the lab. Um, by all means, these are not astronomers. We have an engineer and a, and a, bio, and a neurologist, biologist. Um, but still, it's, it's still the cliche, are you like ripping and roaring through science, which no, no one characterizes us like that. I wish, but no one does. We're usually characterized as like the nerdy, push up the glasses and always has a calculator and just like, oh well. <laughs> My phone is my calculator. Hmm? Inside, you're like the one on the left, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> on the inside, yes, most of us in the lab are like, yes, we're doing science. Um, but yes, uh, by all means, and it's not bad to be associated like Amy. By all means, she is brilliant. Um, and she actually has a PhD in real life. She's actually uh, the only cast member to have a PhD on that cast. So we're all like, yes, yay, awesome. Uh, but still, it's still a matter of representation that we're considered either really geeky or like, well, we're hardly ever associated like Ripley. I wish we were. Uh, so unfortunately, 
there are still harassment issues. And I needed to bring this up uh, in particular because it's now becoming more of a problem, unfortunately. Uh, so I just got back from a conference in Houston, week-long conference in Houston, uh, dealing with NASA uh, in, in particular, in the Lunar and Planetary Science Institute. So fun stuff. They just created their harassment policy. Why this was not created years ago eludes me, but it's now become a problem where they actually have to create a policy for it. Uh, and I've certainly had my fair share of some of these quotes as well, um, particularly of the favoritism. Usually the credit goes elsewhere. Um, whether that means like, well, I'm just the student. No, credit should be where credit is due, especially in this time of age. Uh, so just wanted to put that out there like, yeah, okay, you know what? It's still a problem. <laughs> still very much a problem, though. So. Uh, so going back to Ripley here, though, I, yeah, we we definitely want to be the geeky type and, and certainly the like ripping and roaring, do science everywhere kind of person. Uh, but unfortunately, that kind of scenario just kind of gets all over the place. Um, so uh, more women programs are starting to become a thing. More women in science conferences are becoming more popular now. Uh, they just did a test run in Canada a couple months back, where it was specifically women in planetary science workshop. And they did it up in Canada. Hundreds of women came. No, awesome. Most of them were students. Hey, most of them were students, uh, which always seems to be the case. Uh, so with that, I'm going to say thank you. All right. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Question about um, some of the older like instruments and artifacts, even back to that uh, the Egyptian little thing that looked like mm -hmm. this, or the German woman who had that like mid. Or, are, are any of those like still around, or museums, or are they all disappeared? They're broken, or what? What's certainly museums. Those? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly museums. I believe. I know that there was a really pretty ornate. Astrolab at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Um, but there are certainly plenty of planetariums that have a museum as part of their collections. Uh, so Adler is certainly one of them. Uh, many of them in New York, if anything else. Uh, it's either New York or California is where you would find the neat stuff. Um, Houston, not so much. They're more of space race type uh, instruments from there. Um, but certainly Chicago, New York, and California, they have some really nice background. Uh, Chicago has more telescopes, like how they would grind the glass, uh, which I never knew was a very process. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. There's all sorts of fun history with astronomy, though, by all means, especially war era. Oh, my. So much to learn still. <laughs> Any other fun questions? Yes. I've always wondered, you know, I've, I've seen like in the, like National Geographic where they would show the lens for a telescope and it would be so huge and they would talk about how they had to be careful that there was no imper imperfections in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's a process. My, uh, my half-brother actually specifically works on that in California. Um, so it's a, it's a huge process. So he works with companies to make large mirrors like that. Um, lenses are, are a different process, per se, but mirrors are where you, like, you do not want to touch it. And they have to have layers of... It's a particular chemical, but aluminum is involved because it's highly reflective. Um, and they have to constantly spray it, and then they have to uh, grind it to make sure it's it's even. But then it's a mirror. You can't have it flat. You need to actually bend it to collect as much light as possible. So then they have to figure out how to bend it, obviously, without breaking it, and then they have to repolish it again. And it's just, depending upon how big it is, 
they have to constantly put aluminum uh, layers on it, and it's just, ugh, it takes weeks. For the mirror for the telescope, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's just fascinating, though. And that never used to be a thing. <laughs> um, uh, most telescopes during war era were glass lenses, and even that took a while. But then mirrors, uh, especially from Hubble Space Telescope, are like, ah, mirrors are so much better. Okay, great. But now we can't touch them. <laughs> Uh, so they're much harder to clean, too. Uh, nope. So I don't particularly work with telescopes anymore. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wondered about that, too. This one that was huge. How do they clean it? No idea. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. He's very carefully. <laughs> very, very carefully. Can you explain again what happens? Uh, we're talking about the... Black Widow? Mm -hmm. Black Widow pulsars. Yeah, can you explain it? Sure. Like how it, how does it, yes, how does it ease out of the plane? What exactly happens? Good point. So <laughs> pulsars are actually uh, really, really fun, and, but they're really tiny, but they really pack a punch. And because of that, because they're so dense, and by dense, I mean you take a teaspoon of a pulsar weighs more than three tankers on Earth very dense, but it can fit inside the city of Fayetteville. Really tiny, eee, really tiny. But because they're so tiny and dense, its gravity pool is immense. So if a star just happens, or a planet or a star just happens to be just close enough, that gravity is going to go, hmm, I like you. <laughs> and it's going to keep pulling and pulling and pulling. So it's like a, unraveling a ball of yarn. It's gravity, yep. And then with spinning, it gets you know, even more momentum. But then as the star is dying and being pulled, sucked, <laughs> sucked into the, the black widow, the pulsar itself is a solid body. And it doesn't like to have stuff on it. And because of that, it's going to spin faster. As it's spinning faster, it can absorb uh, material into itself quicker. Because <laughs> otherwise, it's... Yeah, <laughs> physics allows it to spin up faster. Um, but because it's spinning up faster, it's rejuvenating its pulse. Um, so we, yeah, we mainly call it black widow pulsars. I've, I've heard a few astronomers call it um, Queen of the Nile because that's a reference to an old black and white movie. Um, yeah, it gets, it gets interesting. Uh, but yeah, it's because I used to research black widow pulsars and they were... Oh, they were interesting. <laughs> yeah, radio telescopes and x-ray telescopes, because x-rays, you can really see how powerful that, that munching <laughs> uh, process is. Radio telescopes, you, you just hear the signals rapidly get quicker and quicker. It's a long process, but we can detect it. <laughs> yeah, so fun stuff. Radio astronomy doesn't get a lot of a lot of publicity as much uh, as as, uh, as much as I'd like. Maybe that'll be another lecture for the fall. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start making a list. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll be back in the fall. <laughs> so radio astronomy. There we go. <laughs> now that would be fun. All right. Any other any other questions? Otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming out and uh, try to survive the rain and stay dry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're inside. Yeah, I was so happy because I've been running all over the place today for um, 